Um, so thanks a million for uh, inviting me. I'm very pleased to be here. And uh, just a second. Thank you. Um, so um, the title of my talk is, is called Spectrum Without Bounds and Networks Without Borders. And hopefully that will um, become uh, obvious by the end of the talk of why it's called that. So um, I'd like to start by admitting I'm not a 5G person. I, I don't kind of think of myself in that context. Um, and it's probably a good uh, given that there's so many experts here. But um, given that the trend here seems to be do, doing some kind of number analysis to be able to tell something meaningful about this, it turns out that I did a number analysis too. And the number analysis I did was that if you thought of the Roman numerals that went with, the, went with each of the generations, um, what that says is that 5G, another way of thinking of it, is VG. And for me, that actually encapsulates what 5G is actually all about and where it's going. It's the virtual generation. And I use that um, in quite a broad way, and I want to explain to you what I mean by that. But to me, it's also the beginning of the end. And it's the beginning of the end, in my opinion, of how we understand traditional mobile operators and how we understand traditional mobile operator business models. And you can think of it uh, as the beginning of the end of, I think, this kind of linear progression of kind of developing the generations one after another. And I think 5G is at this kind of cusp where you see that a certain amount of technology is emerging that is following on and is taking that linear approach. And at the same time, there's a huge amount of things kind of bursting forward into all sorts of different directions that people are trying to, you know, grasp and tie down. But I actually don't think they're tie downable. Uh, and that's kind of what I want to talk about, about this notion of virtual, and I want to relate it back to spectrum and explain a bit about that. So uh, the word virtual and virtualization is a very complex topic. People mean everything and anything by it. It depends on what layer of the network you're talking about. It depends who you're talking to. Sorry, I don't know why that, I'll just, in case there is some timing thing on for some reason. Um, so it depends on who you're talking to. Oh, this is all in, um, for some reason there's timing on here by mistake, but. Um, it depends, it, can you just fix, turn the timing off? Uh, can you just see, can, I think the animation is for some reason gone into a timing or else I can just keep pushing the button. But it depends on who you're talking to um, about, um, just if you just could push it back, yeah. It depends on who you're talking to as to what that means. And um, for me, it actually means how do we create the illusion of infinite resources? I actually think that's the key thing. So if you look at cl cloud computing and the virtualization there and you think of something like Netflix, that's what it's doing. It's giving you the feeling that all of the resources you want are brought to you. And where I'm interested in things is I'm interested in how we create um, that feeling of infinite resources, but we create it throughout the network. In a world where everyone is demanding more and more resources, in a world where some of those resources are quite finite, and in a world where um, those resources are very, very important. So when I stand back and I think, what does virtualization mean? And what does a network look like? Um, this is what I think of. So a network for me, or a network of the future, is about sourcing the resources you want, it's about selecting a subsection of those. It's about gluing those subsections together to deliver the service you want to deliver. Uh, it's very, very service driven. Um, it's about you know, that service, what that service wants uh, and where that service is going. So when I mean, what I mean by each of those things, when I talk about sourcing, I think that we are well past the idea uh, are the, the time when a network, and we, we use it all the time, comes just from a Vodafone or an O2. Um, we're increasingly in a space where the resources that make up the network come from companies or institutions, but crowdsourced and from individuals, and are a mix of exclusive and shared resources. So I think this whole idea that you can only offer a quality of service by being in full control of every resource that you own is kind of passed us by, and we need to think of it in this kind of larger pool-like way. I think the selection process is where the new network architecture spaces are going to play out, the new kind of players. So when I think of this, I think of things like eBay or Amazon or Google being the kinds of um, entities that can kind of play into the space and allow you to compose the different elements of your network together. And you can pay for them, you can find them through databases, you can use dynamic auctions, you can use slow and static auctions, you can use reputation mechanisms, and you can use different kinds of currencies. So the currency we all use most apart from hard cash is privacy. We pay 
with privacy and exchange. We get a great Google service for, um, for finding what we want and we give up things about ourselves. So I think there's all sorts of new ways kind of for selecting and paying for the elements you want that make up your network. And then when I think of them being glued together, and earlier on when I was talking um, or when I was listening to Dirk, I thought that I, I kind of had disagreed with Dirk originally, but maybe there's some agreement here. For me, the cognitive radio of the future, and this is, this is how I represent a cognitive radio, it's a radio that can observe and think for itself, it can strategize, it can collaborate with other things, other entities, it's flexible. Or when I think of open flow or whether I think of SDN, they're things that allow me to glue stuff together. They allow me to actually uh, put things together the way I want from this pool of resources that I, that, that I pick. And when I think of serving, what I think of is um, operators now that are highly specialized. And everything becomes a service. So for example, it could be a streaming as a service. I, I put in the remote surgery as a service from listening to you this morning. Um, uh, IoT as a service is a very broad uh, term there. Obviously, a machine-to-machine -machine service that looks at very, very bursty things is very, very different to one that has rich uh, media-type services that the Sony uh, person was speaking about. Uh, but the whole idea is, I think, every operator will be a virtual operator with a very, very kind of niche uh, focus of what they're good at. And the pool of resources which you select, so the selection you make from the pool of resources to glue your network together will actually be targeted at that rather than this generic thing uh, you know, that kind of is optimised, that kind of exists in the first place and is optimised subsequently. And I was even thinking when I heard um, about the decoupling of the uplink and the downlink that, uh, that Misha and um, a Vodafone are involved in, that uh, you can have uplink as a service, or you can have downlink as a service, and you kind of start to think of things in a different way and how you compile the network in a different way when you start to think like that. And I think kind of what this diagram hits at, I know that wireless at KTH, for example, are hugely interested in looking at how the market evolves in the future and whether we will have a few large players who offer us services or very, very many small players. And I do see the world going from this kind of a small number of large players and it fragmenting into these small players with many, many small players, or, or many different, I won't use the word small, many different players kind of wanting to get a piece of this and the new communication systems of the future being made up from very different companies and the companies that are kind of represented here. And I, there probably will be um, a coming together again. So there's kind of a, construct, a deconstruction and there'll probably be some other big entities that emerge in the end. But I think of this as a cycle. And I think we're at a really, really interesting point in that cycle where that fragmentation is, uh, is happening and kind of really, really interesting things can happen. And the technologies that we are creating is kind of helping that fragmentation. So, so for me then, the pool of resources from which a network is composed consists of all and any of these things. So when I think of resources, I think of them as being hardware or software. I think of them as being physical things like, you know, uh, whether you call spectrum a physical thing or not, I think of them as being spectrum or I think of them as being uh, base stations or access points or processing power or storage. And the way I describe it is I think the network of the future will be composed into existence in response to a service need rather than a static entity that you optimize um, kind of in what you can consider a dynamic way but nonetheless as a static entity that you optimize to deliver the service you want. So um, because I'm here to talk about spectrum, I actually want to talk about the spectrum aspect of this. But before I do, um, I just want to answer the question. So why should we bother thinking of a network in this way, rather than thinking of a network um, kind of the way we kind of more traditionally think of it. And um, I, uh, I've been thinking a lot as to what the reasons for that were. And I have uh, many, many answers. Um, and this graph, uh, to me, is one of the most alarming answers. Um, and I, uh, it's a question I would throw out here. So this is a Cisco forecast, and maybe they're right or wrong, for LTE deployment in Europe um, between uh, where is it again from, I think it's to 2018. So this is 2013, the yellow is LTE deployment, and this is 2018, the LTE deployment. If you compare that to their forecast for the US or the forecast for Asia, it is pathetic. We are in a really, 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 really bad space. And when I look at that, I think, why is that like that? There's many policy, technical, um, and commercial reasons, but nonetheless, it is like that. And that to me says something's wrong. And how can we be planning what we're planning next uh, when clearly, are we just going to skip a generation? Maybe we'll do that. But to me, that, that, that brings up more questions than it does answers. So if I put it into a, a wider context, to me, there's lots of reasons why things are, why we should bother thinking anew. 
It's the reason I just mentioned the cow is meant to represent uh, the urban rural divide. I think that has never satisfiedly been answered. So if we're not doing that right, shouldn't we try and do something different? I think machine to machine is a big reason why we need to think differently. I think we can't uh, think of machine to machine as something that's fitted in to the next generation. Um, we've been doing this already. So if you think of Wi-Fi offload, what is Wi-Fi offload? It's a mobile operator creating the illusion of infinite resources for the end user by giving them the experience that the network can um, do anything you want by offloading you to a wireless or Wi-Fi nodes. So if we're doing that, why don't we do more of it? And why do we just have to do it in this very, very limited way? You know, uh, I think people are a little bit afraid of kind of the chaos of uh, Wi-Fi and now they're com completely embracing it, but why can't we push more? And if we look in other sectors, there's really, really interesting things happening. So I have Airbnb up here because if you look at the way it's thinking about services, so it started off as a place to replace a hotel stay. So you book online and you stay in somebody's house. Now it's taking a much more microservice approach where you can gather services together so you can actually have the service of staying in someone's house. You can also order towels, clean towels or fresh water or having the laundry done. And you can bring these services together and have a whole service made up of tiny little services. And I think that kind of model is, is worth thinking about. But finally, I think the reason that we need to bother is because people always want more of everything and everything we do is not enough but also that people want choice. And I think that's something we can't forget when we talk about networks kind of all converging towards one, our limited number of people controlling them. So people do want that choice and do want to be able to do things in different kinds of networks. So having said all that, um, I just want to talk about Spectrum for a little bit. And what I want to talk about is why we can't treat Spectrum differently uh, because if we did, I think we could take a much, we would have a much more kind of abundant experience of spectrum. And for me, this all relates back to the kind of this whole kind of virtual world and the creation of illu the illusion of infinite resources. Um, but by that, I don't mean um, I'm talking about unlicensed spectrum. I don't mean that it's licensed versus unlicensed. I don't mean that it's kind of just one way or the other way of doing it. So the way I think about spectrum is I use this quite a lot. So um, for some people here, just don't worry too much about the labels I've chosen. You could put other labels. This is just one illustration. Um, and in economics, people talk about goods as being excludable or non-excludable. So you can exclude somebody from accessing something, or you, might, you, can, or you can't. And they think of things as being rival or non-rival. So I have some examples up there, um, you know, like um, a private car, I can exclude something from it. A sign, we can all look at this. This is an example of a non-rival thing. Everybody can look at this and you know, my consumption of this slide isn't affecting anyone else's consumption. And for me, Spectrum is a resource that can be consumed anywhere in this continuum. And the technologies we've been developing are actually helping us to push Spectrum around that continuum. So if I look at this, something goes from being rival to non-rival through simple things, power rules, spread spectrum, but then more complicated things, interference mitigation techniques, advanced scheduling, massive MIMO, right down to things like full duplex communications. In other words, everything we're doing is allowing more and more and more people to consume spectrum at the same time. On the other hand, we are also developing you know, policies and new ways of thinking that push us across that way. So we've moved from static access to kind of more dynamic um, access mechanisms, you know, to dynamic auctions, uh, to, 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 com to commons like entities. So we actually have the ability to actually move around this and consume spectrum in so many different ways, in ways that unleash different kinds of access, unleash different kinds of business models. But what we actually do is we actually stop in a small number of those spots. So this is um, licensed spectrum as we know it today. And you could argue, <coughs> is that maybe TV white space? Is that Wi-Fi or does it go right up there? You can argue, but where, you can argue exactly where it lands. But the key qu point is, is that what we do is we make choices that limit this. And in my opinion, a lot of the choices that we make that limit this are based out of the fear that opening it up will open up so many other different business models and potential opportunities that we won't be able to control them. Um, uh, and I think it is an awful pity because we constantly think of these within a narrow confines um, of how we can use them for a limited view.
So I think the best way of illustrating this for me is the PCAST versus the LSA. So the PCAST uh, approach is the approach in the 3.5 gigahertz band in the US at the moment, and the LSA approach is um, the kind of European approach from the way I'm describing it here. And in the PCAST band, what the latest uh, FCC documentation says is there's going to be three tiers. There's the incumbent, the priority access user, and the general authorized user. Uh, they've made some really, really interesting kind of approaches here, or interesting kind of rules that they're suggesting they'll make. One of them is that 50% of the spectrum that's available after the incumbent uh, is um, taken out of the picture would be put aside for general authorized access. Um, the other thing that they've made that's really interesting is that the priority access is the licenses for a year only, and you can only get so many of them in a row. And what that is actually doing, it's actually pushing around the space. It's making things less excludable. It's kind of moving into different directions here. And I think it's actually opening the way to a lot of new things. I think, for example, that 50% of general authorized access, you can see that uh, short range machine to machine things could benefit greatly there are, are things that, um, that we're using a, a high bandwidth. On the other hand, what's happening, and again, I'm probably maybe exaggerating slightly in, 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 in pros and cons, on the European side, the license shared access approach is two tier. There's an incumbent and the sharer. And if you look at all of the literature, that sharer is a mobile network operator as we currently understand it. And that's how a lot of the, uh, the literature is written. It's not written for a kind of a wider uh, group of entities that might come in and offer different kind of services. It's not even written, I think, in the context of machine to machine or even in, in the context of 5G. It's very much written in, in terms of how we understand now. So I suppose my main point is that when you think of spectrum, when you think of spectrum as a resource, a commodity that you can use, what we're constantly doing is we're limiting the opportunities, which in the medium term we can think is to our benefit because it's kind of protecting uh, you know, outside players from coming in. But I think in the longer term, it can be quite, um, uh, quite limiting, and limiting for Europe in particular, I would say. So um, I don't know whether everybody knows this book. It's a book about collaborative consumption by Rachel Botsman, and it's called What's Mine is Yours. And the way I see things going in terms of spectrum is, is what's mine is mine and what's yours is mine. And I really do think that we really, really need to be careful that while we're developing fantastic technologies, we're, we're, we're learning how to share spectrum, we're learning how to do all these other things, that we constantly restrict the space in which they're, they're deployed. We keep it within something that we understand now rather than something that it can be, that this could cause us problems. So I'm nearly finished. Um, I was giving out uh, at a meeting yesterday about the fact you can't go anywhere without anyone mentioning Massive MIMO, and now I'm actually going to do it. But um, I'm not a Massive MIMO person either. This is a slide from somebody that, that I work with. But this is just a very simple example of an initial stage scenario where we considered, supposing you have your, uh, it's an MD MIMO system, distributed MIMO. You have all your remote radio heads. You don't own them all. There, some of them are crowdsourced. You have your processing um, uh, storage in the cloud, and you have spectrum. So you can buy spectrum, buy infrastructure, or buy antennas. And in fact, uh, you can think of those as a pool, in the pool that you compose your network out of, that you deliver your service that I spoke about. And there's all sorts of interesting behaviors that emerge that makes it sensible for you, under certain conditions, to buy more spectrum, under other conditions to buy more antennas, under other conditions to optimize your processing, under other conditions to optimize your power. And this isn't a very illustrative graph, it's, 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 it's very, very early, but the, the point is, is you have more degrees of freedom. If, for example, an incumbent takes Spectrum back, you have a way of addressing the situation by adding more uh, distributed things. Yes, there are synchronization issues, backhaul issues, et cetera, et cetera. But in a world where you think differently, where they are sourced, you have the potential to think differently how you deliver the service that you want. So I think in summary, uh, I suppose what I want to say is I think no matter what we think, um, because of user demands, because of technological advances, because of interests of new players in being communications providers. They can be the games industry. We were talking in the break uh, with Klaus about, you know, my nephew, how he communicates with his uh, friends is over the games cons uh, co console. Um, they can be the Googles of the world who are interested in 3.5 gigahertz and fiber. Um, 
It's also because of the prosumer mindset, and I think we've heard a lot about this. The person at the end wants to be the app developer and wants to insert something into the network or insert that piece of kit into the network. I think it's kind of inevitable that things will kind of disintegrate, fragment, and break down. I think that's also kind of uh, exciting. I think there will be new entities that build it back into different kind of superpowers. But for me, 5G or this V, this virtual generation, is the cusp of that happening and kind of things going in a in a new direction. So, thank you.